been mighty pure sublime Coming from the heart of Jesus Just the same through test of time He the pearly gates will open So that I may enter in For He purchased my redemption and forgive me all my sin. Love divine so great and wondrous, all my sins he then forgave, and I will sing his praise forever, for his blood is power to my redemption and forgave me all my sin and even in, the, in life's twilight at his door I'll knock and wait by the precious love of Jesus I shall enter heaven's gate my redemption and forgave me all my sin and forgave me all my sin Please open in your scripture. Oh, uh, Junior Church is dismissed at this time. So Junior Churchers, you are out of here. We're going to have a great time. We're not going to tell you what happens. Matthew chapter 3, while they're dismissing, please, we please open in the Scripture, first book of the New Testament, Gospel of Matthew, and chapter 3. You've been here for a few weeks. You may have guessed that this would perhaps be uh, where we would be at in, our, in the Scripture. You say, Pastor, you know, it seems like you're always preaching through books of the Bible. And let me just give a little explanation of why it is particularly that from this pulpit that's our style of preaching. I do believe that expository preaching is important. Expository would be where you would give the sense of the text and preach through a passage of Scripture. And it, it involves a lot of study, a lot of Bible study in it and an understanding of the text and the themes of the text. Why I believe that is important is because many times Christians know concepts. They know topical truth. In other words, they know this is true, but they don't have it as from a deep sense of this is what God's Word is saying. And when Jesus, for instance, was teaching His disciples about discipleship, and that is what Matthew is all about, is the making of disciples. Jesus teaching His disciples and then Matthew's perspective on Jesus and the Gospel. From that, He had specific things He wanted the disciples to learn. If we are disciples, then those same specific truths that Jesus wanted them to learn also transcend us, do they not? And so we want to make sure that we preach more than just topics that pastor uh, lays out or pastor determines that need to be preached. I think that's important to follow God's leading in the preaching. I think it's also important that as we preach, that we give the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God is the Word of God. And so that's one of the reasons I, that we strongly... I uh, emphasize expository preaching every now and again. Uh, fairly frequently, I'll feel led to preach something that isn't part of a series that we're doing. And if the Holy Spirit leads, that'll be for a purpose, and it'll be because of the Lord's leading. But primarily, we want you, when we get done, to know what's in Matthew when we're preaching through this portion of Scripture. I think they said Bible. Okay, so let's, let's read our Bibles. Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to look down at verse 7. And this is John the Baptist speaking when people were coming to him in Jordan confessing their sins. And I want to look at verse 7 and moving on down. We'll read all the way down to verse 13. Speaking of John, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, 
who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will freely purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So I want to preach a message today about what is chaff. What is chaff? What will burn? Let's pray for the Lord's help. Father, I pray that you would direct my words today, help them to be more than just man's wisdom or man's notions and concepts. I pray that today that they would be a true reflection of what you gave us in your word, that the word of God would be taught and preached here today, and you'd use me as an instrument for that. And God, I pray that your spirit would speak these words today, that your Holy Spirit would speak to individual hearts, that you would teach us true spiritual concepts so that we could know for sure that we're born again first, and secondly, know for sure what the gospel is. And I just thank you for what you teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is a passage of Scripture, actually, uh, that is not controversial. I don't believe any portion of the Scripture is controversial. But it is a passage of Scripture that oftentimes is taken from its context and placed into another context. Meant uh, to, or used to teach something other than what it actually teaches. There are individuals who go through the Bible and develop a doctrine uh, for salvation. And by salvation, in the context I'm using it, I do not mean deliverance from a circumstance. There are salvations from circumstances, aren't there? You ever had a near call? Like something nearly almost would have gotten you and it was really like a whoa. You know, and you realize, man, God saved me from that circumstance. I have a neighbor who I'm... He's, I don't live there anymore, but he is my neighbor still. He still stops by my house. But I have a neighbor from where I used to live. And I'm praying for him to be born again. And he's had salvation experiences. Uh, he told me, we were talking about spiritual things and just talking about whether there's a God and that sort of thing. And he told me, he said, you know, there are a couple of times when I should have been killed and I was not. He talked about a time when he just lost his balance and he fell into the street. And he, and he should have been run over by a bus and he didn't even know what happened, but he wasn't. And I said, you know, I think God spared your life. And he said, I know God did. That was salvation. In other words, he was not physically killed and so he was delivered. Salvation is deliverance. You understand the context of that? In other words, he wasn't born again. I remember my uncle uh, telling me about a uh, circumstance or situation that he had. He, he, came, he uh, came in the house... And we were at my aunt and uncle's house. Both of them are since passed, passed, but we were in their house, and he came in the house, and he was just kind of very emotional, very overwrought. And he said, Jesus just saved me. And he didn't mean salvation from sin. He wasn't born again yet at that time. But he had been out fishing at the lake, and he had come home, and I guess there was so much of a storm that was actually... You know, it was enough to flip vehicles and things over. If you've ever been to Kansas, what we call hurricanes here, that's weather in Kansas. That's the way it is. And he was fishing, and he was coming back, and literally he thought, I'm not going to survive this storm. He was in his truck pulling a boat, and he, he, he said, you know, Jesus and I were walking hand in hand. He said, all I can say is Jesus saved me from the storm. And I don't know what that storm was like. Evidently, it was something that was a real circumstance God gave him in his life. And he said, God saved me, or Jesus saved me. Now, he did not mean he saved my soul from hell. He meant I didn't get killed today in the circumstance. You understand salvation has context. Everybody understand that? Uh, salvation, what happened when I was saved was when I was born again. And born again is what a lot of us, a lot of times, are talking about when we're talking about salvation. Well, a lot of times people will do the same things with repentance 
as they do with the word salvation. In other words, every time you're talking about salvation, you're talking about being born again. Well, every time the Bible uses salvation, it's not talking about being born again. Psalm, for The Psalms, for instance, would give many instances where the Scripture teaches salvation as in being delivered from circumstances. David often talks about being saved or being delivered. And those are salvific terms, if you will, but not talking about his eternal soul and whether or not he had faith in God. you understand the difference? Okay, now there are a lot of Christians, honestly, that are uh, systematically putting together or developing concepts that talk about repentance, which is, a, which is necessary for salvation, and taking context for salvation, and they're adding all the different contexts together and making them requirements for us to be born again or on our way to heaven. Now, I just want to dispense with something just at the beginning, first of all. Um, let me just put it this way. No one understands the gospel better than Jesus. Okay? Can we agree about that? Yes. Nobody understands the gospel better than Jesus. Anyone who gives a different gospel than Jesus is preaching another gospel than Jesus preaches. Can we at least say that? Now you can say, well, Pastor, you could be saved from that gospel. Well, well, let's don't go there yet. But let's at least agree that anyone that gives a different gospel than Jesus preaches is preaching another gospel than Jesus does. And no one knows the gospel better than Jesus. It's so, isn't it? Okay, so when we talk about being born again and having eternal, everlasting life, the best place to simply understand the gospel, it's not what I'm preaching this morning, but I'm just qualifying what I'm preaching with this. The best place in the Bible to understand the gospel is in John chapter 3. When Nicodemus came to Jesus as a religious ruler of the Jew, as a Pharisee, and he came to Jesus, really we understand from the context, trying to figure out how he could know for sure that he has eternal life. And Jesus told Nicodemus, that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus simply said that, that being, having eternal salvation or being saved from sin is, is received upon being born again, or it happens by being born again. And he distinguished the difference between physical birth and spiritual birth. The reason he used the word or the terms born again was because a lot of times we just go, uh-huh, 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 and we just agree with everything somebody says, but we don't actually think. And when Jesus told Nicodemus, okay, you're going to go to hell unless you get born again, Nicodemus is thinking, I better get born again, huh? How do I do that, right? In other words, if I told you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God or cannot see the kingdom of God. So you ask me, Pastor, am I going to heaven or hell? Well, if you're, unless you're born again, you're not going to go to heaven. You're, going to, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus made that really clear, didn't He? So then Nicodemus' question was, what do you mean? See, because nobody knows how to get born again without knowing already or having been taught with the Scripture what Jesus said being born again is. On purpose, Jesus used a confusing requirement to cause Nicodemus to understand the truth behind it. And Jesus was talking about spiritual birth. He, didn't, he wasn't talking about being born spiritually again and again and again. He was talking about you've been born physically and now you must be born again spiritual. And he distinguished the difference between a person who is born naturally through no volition or will of their own. In other words, when you were born the first time, you had very little to do with it. You were more just an unwilling, involuntary participant, right? You didn't say, hey, you know, I think I'm about to go into the world. No, God had a hand in it. Your parents had a hand in it. And it happened to you. You had nothing to do with it. So, uh, everybody here has been born, but it, it's not your fault. Okay, we'll just put it that way. You had nothing to do with it. It just happened to you. All right, now spiritual birth's different. Nobody is going to say, how did I get here when they get to heaven? That's true. Nobody's going to, you know, they're going to die. There are a lot of people that think that they're just going to get to heaven and they don't know how. But I'm just telling you, nobody in heaven is going to wonder how they got there. It will be because they were born again and they were born again on purpose. 
See, being born again spiritually is an on-purpose choice of the will. And Jesus explained that. Nicodemus asked Jesus the question then, how can these things be? Or is how can I... Okay, if I've got to be born spiritually, how? And Jesus said that the gospel was this. He said, me. I am the gospel. Listen, I don't want to oversimplify this morning. I understand you have to know who Jesus is and what Jesus did and receive Jesus. But the gospel is nothing more than one word, Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. You want to simplify the gospel, you want to just boil it down, Jesus is the gospel. Jesus said, first of all, He said, if you're talking about being part of the kingdom of God, He said, nobody's been to heaven. No one's ever come from heaven, no one's been to heaven except Me, the Son of Man which has come from heaven. So He said, if you're going to get to heaven, you need somebody that first knows where it is, and secondly, that knows how to get you there. See, my friend, I'm going to just point this out to you this morning. This is encouraging. Even if you receive Jesus as your Savior, it's just a good reminder. Listen, there's no way but Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I just want to tell you something. If you're depending on anything but Jesus, first of all, you're wrong, and secondly, you have a great deal of uncertainty. You'll never be sure of anything when you're trusting anything but Jesus to get you to heaven because nobody's been to heaven but Jesus. There are a lot of people when you ask them, how are you getting to heaven? And they will give you, for example, things that they are doing or that they believe are helping them to get to heaven. I've had people say, well, you know, I was baptized. I'm sorry, but Jesus never said getting baptized will get anybody to heaven. won't get you to heaven. Uh, you know, I've gone to church my whole life. There's nothing in the Bible anywhere that says going to church gets you to heaven. I'm a good person. My good works are going to outweigh my bad works. That's one of the silliest notions I've ever heard of, to be quite honest with you. A thinking person that considers that good outweighs bad uh, understands that good is good and bad is entirely separate of it. Can you imagine having any kind of a relationship on a good versus bad you know, deal? Uh, for instance, let me let me let me illustrate it this way. I get mad at people. I was talking to Charlie about this last night. I get mad at people that talk like marriage is a tough thing. It just irritates me, personally. It's not a personal level. Marriage is not hard. Marriage is not difficult. If you love your wife and you're what you're supposed to be, and she loves you, and she's what she's supposed to be, marriage is not difficult. I've been married for only 16 and a half years, but I've been married long enough to tell you this. Not even quite 16 and a half years. I've been married long enough to tell you this. Nothing on any day ever that has happened in my marriage has ever threatened our relationship. Like my wife and I have never in 16 and a half years had anything that has threatened our relationship, and so marriage is not tough in that sense. You understand what I'm saying? Or as, uh, you say, Pastor, are you saying you have a perfect relationship? Well, you know, my, my wife's not perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And neither am I. Uh, but we've never, you know, we've just, we've never, I'll be honest with you, we don't fight. Never have. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong with you. I like to fight. I know. Uh, <laughs> some people do, but it shouldn't threaten your relationship. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, can you imagine, though, if my wife and I had a good versus bad uh, relationship? In other words, our relationship, whether we stay married or not, is conditioned on how much good we do versus how much bad we do. I mean, I'd have to really keep track just so I know what I could get away with. Right? I mean, what if I was just a good husband like six days out of the week? I mean, I'd, I would literally have, you know, on, on, on Saturday, I would just go wild. I mean, I would do everything I could to irritate my wife, to disrespect my wife, to harm our relationship, and I'd have six good days to compensate for that one day. Would that, would that be a... What do you think my marriage would be like the next six days if I did that for one day out of seven? What if I did it half and half, three and a half days, you know, Wednesday at noon? I started being a monster if I was really good until Wednesday at noon. You know, I'm just, I'm the perfect husband. Wednesday at noon, you know, it's sort of like Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, how do you think my marriage would go? You know, my relationship with my wife is more dependent on the bad than I do than actually the good. 
Can you imagine my being a, an ogre? You can think of whatever behaviors you think would be bad ladies and men. Can you imagine if, my, if I were just a jerk three and a half days, but I was really wonderful the next three and a half days? Can you imagine what kind of relationship what I would have? That's silly, isn't it? In other words, it isn't the good that I do that helps us have a bad relationship. It's actually more about the bad that I don't do. Because anything bad that I do in our relationship is going to negate anything good. And the same is true with sin, and the same is true with, with uh, breaking of any kind of a law. You don't get called before a court for keeping the law. You don't get judged for doing right. You get judged for doing wrong, right? We have all kinds of laws and all kinds of judges in our culture and our society. We have what is called code enforcement. You may know what code enforcement is. I'm glad if you don't, <laughs> actually. But Charlie and I know, don't we? <laughs> so code enforcement uh, doesn't bother you if everything at your place is neat and in order. By the way, somebody needs to call code enforcement on the people in front of our property here. You notice these trees, this mess out here? Yeah, somebody needs to call code enforcement on us. This is a mess. Uh, they came by last week. This is just, this is nothing new thing. They came by two weeks ago on Wednesday night, and they went like this, and they grabbed like a thing full of leaves, put it in the truck, and drove off. <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, we're getting the, we're getting all the stuff hauled off. I think right now they're getting paid per load, and they're only taking easy stuff. So <laughs> I don't know when when this is going to happen, but when code enforcement comes, okay, code enforcement doesn't come out right when everything is pristine and perfect at your house. When do they come out? When you got a car parked on the grass, when you haven't cut your lawn, when you haven't mowed your lawn, uh, when you've built something without a permit. When something's wrong, that's when they come out. And they don't say, well, you know, we just want to commend you on doing everything right except for. <laughs> right? They want to talk to you about what you're doing wrong, and then they want to look around and see if there's anything else wrong you're doing. Okay, so we have code enforcement. We have law enforcement that... Uh, um, tries to keep us safe on the roads. I think that's the purpose of law enforcement on the roads. Okay, they enforce speed limits. For some of you, they enforce them more so than they do for me, but they enforce speed limits. And they don't stop you when you are you know, going with the flow of traffic, signaling correctly, obeying all the signs on the road, and uh, going, you know, uh, you know, obeying every traffic law there is. When do they stop you? Yeah, whenever you do something wrong, right? You go through a red light. Uh, you don't stop at a stop sign. You, you know, you go about 20 miles faster than the speed limit says, or whatever. I don't know what the limits are around here, but when that's when they stop you, and they don't say, "Well, you know, we're here to weigh your good works and your bad." They don't care about that. And friend, it's every bit as ridiculous to think that God takes good and God takes evil, and f decides, you know, whether we got more good than bad. Any bad you do negates your good. And the same is true with sin. We don't get judged by a holy God for how good we are. We get judged for how bad we are. And the Bible says that God's tolerance for sin is zero. Okay, so Jesus knows the gospel better than anyone. The gospel is Jesus. We said that. This is all according to John chapter 3. And Jesus put the gospel this way. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, or in the same way, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said, lifting me up is how a person believes and how a person has eternal life. Well, Jesus, we know, was lifted up on the cross. But what is the illustration of lifting Him up? Well, it's an illustration of looking to the serpent in the wilderness for healing from being bit by a poisonous snake. And you and I, our salvation is from looking to Jesus for salvation from our sin because He died for our sin. That's faith. That's believing in Jesus. And the Bible puts it this way, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay, so uh, the, then the Bible goes on to say, He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. My friend, you all you have to do to go to hell is nothing. All you have to do to go to hell is nothing because you're already condemned because of your sin. But if you believe, you're not condemned. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. And as we said when we opened this morning, no one knows the gospel better than Jesus. And now we'll segue into our text.
after what about a you know 45 minute introduction or so. <laughs> I hope you're having as much fun as I am. Uh, so here we are in John chapter or Matthew chapter three. I mean to say, and I want to point out that this passage of scripture does teach repentance, and I want to talk about repentance just a little bit. But I want us to understand from what Jesus said the gospel was what the gospel actually is, because I know of folks that write books explaining the gospel from this passage of Scripture. And this is not where the, script, the gospel is clearly explained in the Scripture in John chapter 3, but I want to look at it in its context and understand some important doctrinal spiritual truths. Okay, so John is baptizing in Jordan. Last week we saw that John was that prophet according to Isaiah chapter 40, that was preparing the way of the Lord and making straight His paths. He was the one that said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was John's message. And John baptized people, and baptism was, was uh, repentance. It did show repentance. And uh, so, what was the repentance that John the Baptist was preaching? Well, here's what happened. In verse 6, we see uh, many of them went out to, from Judea and around Jordan. In verse 6, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But in verse 7, the Bible says about John the Baptist, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath of come, to come? Now that word warned there is actually a word that uh, carries with the idea of telling you of future events. Okay, so the warning is, let you know the end, or who has given you the future events, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, this doesn't seem nice to me. Does it to you? John the Baptist is outside, he's out in the wilderness, and he's baptizing outside by Jordan. People are coming to them, to him, they are confessing their sins, and he's baptizing them. The baptism is an identification with the belief that, Jesus, that the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, that the Messiah has already come. We know that the Messiah has already come. Anyone who wanted to know could know that because of, first of all, Herod's killing all the babies. In, in chapter 2 we saw Herod's killing all the children uh, in, in uh, all the regions around Jerusalem and Judea and so forth because Christ was born. Remember, that's why God had Joseph flee with the child into Egypt so Jesus wouldn't be killed. All Jerusalem, the Bible says, was troubled at the birth of Jesus. Do you remember this? It's just a couple of weeks ago. Why were they troubled at the birth of Jesus? They were troubled because Herod's the king, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious established system, you know, they had a system set up, and Jesus pretty much shook up their whole, whole worldview. So the wise men came seeking Jesus. They came because they believed the prophecy in Daniel 9, uh, Daniel chapter 9 about specifically when Christ would be born. It was literally prophesied to the time that Jesus Christ would be born. Study in your Bible sometime. So the men who believed in Jesus, who believed God, uh, those men who had been taught by Daniel, the Babylonians, who should have been mere pagans, they believed the Scripture. And then the people of Jerusalem, the Bible says, were troubled by Jesus Christ's birth, by His coming. Why were they troubled? Well, a lot of reasons, but because of their unbelief. In other words, what we saw was that Christ was born. The virgin birth, the miraculous birth, was an indisputable occasion or occurrence. A star literally came and stood over the place where Jesus Christ was. Angels told the shepherds, we know, that the Christ is born. And Jerusalem was troubled. Why was Jerusalem troubled? Well, because they were in unbelief. They didn't believe in Jesus. Now, John is preaching the gospel, and while he's preaching the gospel, people are believing. But then comes a crowd of individuals to John the Baptist's baptism, and they come to be baptized. That's what the Scripture indicates here. They came to him, and John saw in that crowd the very people who were troubled by the birth of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw them, here's what I'd think. Good. Good, they're coming around. Right? In other words, when Jesus was born, they were complicit with Herod in executing every baby trying to kill the Messiah. That's bad. Let's nod our heads. That's bad, isn't it? Okay, everybody agree? Okay, they were very bad in their unbelief. And now John the Baptist is baptizing people who are confessing their sins. Uh, outside of Jordan, and now he sees the very people who were in unbelief, who were leading in unbelief, the Pharisees, 
And uh, the, uh, the Bible says the Sadducees. Now here's the thing about Sadducees. You know this, don't you? Pharisees were people who were very, very conscientious about keeping the law. Sadducees were people who actually didn't really believe in a supernatural God. That's the best way I can put it. They didn't believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in life after death. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in an eternal God. So they were kind of like politically religious. You know what I'm talking about? In other words, there are nations of people that are politically religious. Isn't it so? Uh, if you live in Italy, you're politically religious. You actually pay taxes to the church as a citizen. You're politically religious, actually. You know, you, you ask somebody who's in Italy, you know, are you a Christian? They say yes. Well, why are you a Christian? Well, I was born. I pay taxes to the church. In other words, their nation is they're nationally religious. That's the way the Pharisees or the way the Sadducees were. But you talk to the same people and you ask you ask a uh, person who's born quote Catholic, and they'll tell you, "Well, I was baptized when I was a baby." Of course, they were. You know, it'd be socially unacceptable not to be. But you ask them, "Were you ever born again?" They'll go. You ask them, "How often do you go to church?" And you you start to inquire about their faith, and you realize oh, there's exceptions. But you realize that most of the people, they, they call themselves, quote, Christian, but they don't really have a, an experience with God. It's just, you know, and then you start asking them really deep questions like, do you believe in evolution? You do this in our country. you believe in evolution? Yeah. I'm going to just tell you something, Christian. If you believe in evolution, you don't believe in a creator God. You can't believe in evolution and believe in creation. They're, they're juxtaposed. They're opposite to each other. Either one's true or the other's true. And so you meet, you meet somebody, they say they're a Christian. Well, I believe in evolution. Okay. Well, I believe there's a God, but, you know, I don't think He could create the world. I think that things happen, they evolved, and so forth. You know, you have to explain things in a way that the human mind uh, it could stretch things by faith, believe. But it, it uh, eliminates the possibility of a supernatural God. You see, what, you see where I'm going with this? You understand this? In other words, a person's religious quote, but they don't believe in a supernatural God. That's pretty much the Sadducees. They don't believe in their life after death. They think when you die, you just go into the ground. I think I'm an honest enough person that if I believe that nothing would happen when I died, I wouldn't waste Sundays being in church. You, you understand where I'm coming from? In other words, I'm not at church because I'm bored. I'm not here because you all are so lovely that this is the only reason I'm here. You're lovely people. Uh, but if God hadn't done something in my heart, this would not be my place. I'd be somewhere else doing something else. Especially if I believe that, that life is, all that we have in life is the number of years that we walk on this earth. I'd be using my days probably very hedonistically, trying to enjoy the pleasures of the flesh for as long as I can, realizing that it's all I've got. And after that, I'll end. Or I may just kill myself because nothing matters. But I wouldn't be religious. Well, the Sadducees are people that are hard for me to understand because they're religious. And I would have to say it was probably politically expedient for them to do so. In other words, an identification as a Jew is a religious identification. And so they were a faction of Jews that just didn't believe in supernatural things. And of course, they always uh, had arguments with the Pharisees who actually did. But in this instance, they are come together. Okay, do you see that, what John is saying? So now if it's me, if I'm John the Baptist and I'm baptizing and the Pharisees and the Sadducees come out, I'd say it's about time. But when John saw him, he said, O oh, generation of vipers. Now the word viper here literally means uh, baby snake offspring kind of thing. So you are a generation of the offspring of a snake. Now, um, he said, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And in verse 8, he says, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Now the word meat is a great word. It's an old English word that means appropriate. So it means something like, you know, it's, it's right for, it's appropriate, it's, it's matching. Bring forth fruits, appropriate or matching, repentance. Well, when, when John says this, I have to say, well, listen, if they came out to be baptized, aren't they... I, Aren't they identifying with everybody else? You say, did they come out to watch or did they come to get baptized? 
Well, it's interesting because John said in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. And so, did they come to be baptized? Well, John said, I'm going to baptize you. So evidently, they came to be baptized. Does that make sense from the text? Here this morning, they didn't come out to observe. They didn't come out to criticize. They came out to be baptized. In other words, if you look at the Scripture, they're coming to hedge their bets. In other words, they're coming because John said, you've been warned to flee the wrath to come, and you're thinking, okay, if, God's, if Christ's wrath is going to come... By the way, the, the, if you knew what the Scripture said in the prophets of the wrath of God and a final judgment, you'd say, okay, I'm afraid of God's wrath. And so they came, the Bible says, to flee wrath. To flee wrath. Now, I don't want to be confusing here today, so let me qualify something. I've had people before say, you know, being saved is not fire insurance. Right? And it's not just, I don't get saved just to escape hell. Well, I'll be quite honest with you, that's a pretty good motivator for me. I've had people say, well, you know, you shouldn't just get saved just because you're afraid of going to hell. If you don't get saved because you're afraid of going to hell, I question your intelligence. <laughs> I'm afraid of hell. I'm afraid of God's wrath. You understand that? So John's point here is not, you know, you're just doing this because you're afraid of God's wrath. He's saying you're just going through an act or an action. You literally are just doing something without a heart behind it at all. You're still Sadducees who don't believe in a supernatural God. Now, why in the world is a Sadducee going to get baptized? Just in case. Right? Isn't it so? Why is a, why is a guy who doesn't believe in life after death going to be concerned with God's wrath? I mean, if God came supernaturally and killed you, you would be dead. And if there's no life after death, what's there to be afraid of? Right? And so John here is exposing people who are religiously hedging their bets. In other words, they're open, they're willing to be baptized actually. Which baptism is an identification with the fact that the Lord Jesus was come. The kingdom of heaven was at hand. So the baptism was actually an identification with the gospel itself, right? Right? They were they was believing in Jesus. But the difference between they and those who had come before them was that before them, the individuals who came were baptized confessing their sins. And these individuals are coming not confessing anything. They're just getting baptized. Do you see it? All the time. Now, uh, if, if this is something you haven't thought through, I'm not criticizing anybody, but all the time when people have newborn babies, I'm so excited about children being born. And I know this, that the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and may Zola not depart from it. I know that a good parent who loves the Lord can raise children that will please God. And it's just a great future for the world when a godly person has a child. It's, just, it's exciting to me. But a lot of times people come and say, Pastor, would you baptize my baby? Would you baptize my baby? I'll dedicate a baby. In other words, I'll have a prayer with you and... and uh, I'll, I'll stand with you as you covenant with God that you're going to raise your child for the Lord Jesus. But I won't baptize your baby. Why won't I baptize your baby? Well, your baby doesn't believe anything. He doesn't repent of anything. He doesn't confess anything. You understand that? Here are individuals who are wanting to have baptism much like infant baptism. Just as much as infant baptism means something to the baby, it does mean something. You know, I just got wet. I like it or don't like it. It just as much as that means something to the baby, this baptism had as much significance to the Pharisees and Sadducees with regard to their hearts. Do you see it? There's no confession. There's no repentance. Now, I will say this. There are individuals that will take this and develop a gospel from it, right? Isn't it so? Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know what? Uh, here's, here's a sin I, I don't like sinner's prayer, but here's, here's a sinner's prayer. Dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner. Um, and I'm repenting of my sins and I'm asking you to save me. Well, my friend, anybody who turns to Jesus repents of their sins, don't they? But what's the major thing that you repent of when you turn to Jesus? Unbelief. In other words, you repent of not believing in Jesus. That's what repentance is in the context of the Scripture. You know, if I were responsible to repent of my sins, first of all, I'd be in trouble because I don't have a good enough memory. 
I couldn't, I couldn't tell you all the things I've done. Just couldn't. Matter of fact, I've done things inadvertently that I probably don't even know are sin, but they still are. My ignorance about sin doesn't make it not sin. So if I'm responsible to confess or to repent of my sins, that's works. You understand that? So the Sadducees and the Pharisees, when they came to John the Baptist to be baptized, are very hypocritically coming to Jesus. They're coming as actors. In other words, they're saying, yeah, I'll be baptized. What would baptism mean to a Pharisee? Let's put it this way. It would mean something different than it would mean to a Sadducee. Wouldn't it? So is, is baptism just anything it means to you? No, it's what it means to God, isn't it? Okay, so let's move forward. The Bible says in verse 9, John said, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. What does John mean? God promised Abraham some things, didn't he? What did John promise? What did God promise Abraham? What? A, a seed, right? And uh, out of the seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Okay. Was that promise more physical, or let me ask the question: Was that promise physical and spiritual, physical or spiritual? Both. Both, right? Okay. Then let's ask the question: Was the promise that God made to Abraham more physical or more spiritual? I'd say more spiritual, right? Because the Bible teaches that we're Abraham's children who are confirmed in belief. So it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing, Abraham's children. And John the Baptist, he said, don't think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. In other words, we're descendants of Abraham, therefore, God, you can't condemn us because you promised Abraham. In other words, I'm safe. I've met these people, haven't you? Yeah, well, I, you know, my mom, my mom is one of the best Christians you ever met as though that does anything for you. Right? Oh, I had a godly grandma. I, no, I don't believe in God. I'll ask atheists. I'll ask people that claim that they don't believe there's a God. I'll say, do you know anybody that you think genuinely believes in a God? Anybody that's real about believing in God? And they'll all mention somebody they know. It's interesting. Use this grandma. I have a grandma who believes in God. And she reads her Bible and she's... And I say, is, is, she, is she stupid? Is she deceived? Is she whatever? You know... They don't want to say that about grandma, usually. No, it's real for her. You know, it's real. Okay. What do you think is going to happen to you if you don't believe in, God, in grandma's God who is real, who judges the wicked, who judges sin? You see the, the thought process? I meet people that tell me, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Well, how are you going to heaven? Well, you know, I come from a Christian family. What does that have to do with anything? This is precisely what the Pharisees and Sadducees are thinking. John said, don't think that because you're a descendant of Abraham that you're, good, that, that you're going to be good. You can just get baptized. You can just do whatever. You can just believe whatever. But you don't accept Jesus Christ for who He is. Don't think that it's okay. As he said, God is able to, of these stones, to raise up children to Abraham. Now, God, I don't think, has ever done that. He hasn't said, okay, Abraham, I'll make you a son. And out comes stuff. You know, I'm being a little silly there, but that isn't what... John the Baptist means. What John the Baptist means is that your heritage means nothing with regard to repentance. See it? Okay. One or two last points. <laughs> Maybe five. Verse 10. And now the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's pretty simple to understand, isn't it? I feel that way. There are in... Let me just share a personal thing. I don't like non-fruiting trees very much. I make an exception in our house. We have frangipani trees, and I make an exception because you can make tea from the leaves. We have some frangipani that are very, very fragrant. You know what I'm talking about? They have like almost a peach scent. They're just... I love the smell of frangipanis. We have those at our house. Uh, but personally, I'm very intolerant of non-fruiting trees. If it doesn't produce something I can eat, then just get rid of it. You know, I don't need oxygen. There are jungles and forests for that. You know, <laughs> the trees are a mess. They leave leaves. They kill grass. They, and just, as far as I'm concerned, if it doesn't produce something, then it should die. And we have a couple at our house. We also have this tree in our backyard. I always forget the name of it. They're the ones 
They're very prolific. They're really like weed trees, I call them. Uh, but they grow really nice flowers right around oh, February and March. You know, they, the, I forget what they're called. They have the red underside of their leaves, green leaves, and then they have the white, really pretty flowers. My wife has saved those trees, but I think they're damaged enough by the hurricane. I'm going to have to just chop them down uh, right now. Okay, now I just tell you this. My standard for a tree is that it needs to produce something. And, and I'm in good company. Do you remember when Jesus went by the fig tree out of season and it didn't have any figs on it? And he said, no fruit on you from henceforth forever. And when they came back by after Jesus had uh, cursed the fig tree, it was dead. Like It just instantly withered up and died. You know? Okay, so Jesus didn't like non-fruiting trees either. All right, now the illustration here is that a person who has the right pedigree but doesn't have the fruit. And we're not talking here about behavior. We're talking about the fruit of repentance. That's the fruit, repentance. A person who says, I don't believe in God, but I'll get baptized. Or a person who says, I oppose the kingdom, but I'll get baptized because I'm afraid of the wrath of God, is not a person who's looking to Jesus for their salvation. Two groups who are coming for different reasons or from a different worldview that's juxtaposed. It's opposite. A group that believes in life after death and a group that doesn't, both coming together to get baptized, is not believing. That is not repentance, is it? In other words, it's a person who says, I believe what I believe and I'll go through a process. And what they were accounting was that somehow what they actually believed wouldn't matter because of who they were as well. I'm a descendant of Abraham and God promised Abraham some stuff. And Jesus said simply this. He said, a tree that doesn't bring forth fruit, the axe is going to be put to the root. And it's going to be chopped down. Then he uses the illustration of winnowing. He uses the illustration of the threshing floor. He says he has his fan in his hand. It's a winnowing fan. It's a shovel. You ever see a winnowing shovel? It's got claws on it. It kind of looks like a backward, uh, backward pitchfork. And if you do winnowing, you know the first thing you do is you... You, you, you put the, the grain down or you put the, you know, if it's wheat and it has it in the heads, then you, you thrash it, you thrash it. You know, oftentimes they would have oxen grinding up the corn. They walk on top of it enough so that it would actually break the wheat out of, out of the uh, stalk. And then you take the winnowing fork and you throw the straw up when there's a wind and you throw the straw up in the air and the chaff, which doesn't have grain in it, is going to blow away and the grain's going to fall straight to the ground. And you keep throwing it up, throwing it up, and throwing it up, and everything that's chaff, the Bible says, isn't the fruit. And so God's going to burn it, the Bible says. And so a person, see, we're not talking about works, we're talking about not works with repentance. You see this? In other words, when we talk about repentance, oftentimes people will take the gospel and they will add fruit, and their fruit defined as works. Well, you know. Uh, if he really believes, then he's going to do this and this and this and this and this. Well, no, actually the fruit is repentance. It's not behavior. This, that's exactly what John the Baptist is saying. In other words, here are people who in their hearts do not believe in Jesus. And they're coming to be baptized. You see it? Here are people who do not believe in Jesus as the Son of God and they're coming to be baptized. That's works, isn't it? That's fruit, isn't it? Well, if this is fruit, or if, if fruit is required for salvation, isn't this good enough? Let me ask you a question. Based on the doctrine, you ever heard somebody talk about, you know, they, if he isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all, or they talk about uh, fruits for salvation. If there's no fruit, then you're not, you know, you're not a genuine Christian. Let me ask a practical question. For those people and for their satisfaction, for anyone that would require works or fruit for salvation, do you think a Pharisee who came to be baptized might qualify for any person that believed in those standards? What do Pharisees do? Works. Right? What did Pharisees do a lot of? Works. I mean, is it not so? Yes, it is. So a Pharisee who is baptized that does works, do you think he would satisfy me that he is a believer? Absolutely would. How could I tell that a Pharisee 
wasn't, wasn't a believer. Hadn't repented. How could I tell? What would a Pharisee do that would be telltale, a real sign that he wasn't a believer? What? Yeah, just that he didn't believe on Jesus. Because the fact of the matter is a Pharisee converted, if you will, to Christianity. You think he'd be here on Monday night when we go soul winning? That's a work. Tuesday, thanks. That's a work, isn't it? He'd be here. You think he'd be here for Sunday school? It's a work. Something he could do. He'd be here. If we had a work day, you think he'd be here? If we fed the poor? Do you think that he would live a clean life? At least as far as is visible? He absolutely would. He would be the best Christian, quote, in our church who would be godless because of his heart. In other words, he'd have all the works. He'd look just fine. He'd be as religious as anybody. You ever met somebody that says this? Well, yes, they don't believe in Jesus, but I'm telling you, they're a better Christian. I hate when people say this. They're a better Christian than most Christians are. You're not a believer. You're not a Christian if you're not a believer. Repentance, my friend, in this context is not works. If it were works, then coming to be baptized would be a work. And it would be acceptable. And John the Baptist said, God's going to cut off people who don't repent. And repentance here in this context isn't just confession of sins. It's unbelief. Because you can't be a Sadducee and believe in Jesus. And you can't be a Pharisee and think that the works of the law will save you and that Christ can save you. You have to repent of those things. And then John said, I indeed baptize you with water. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. So if they, were, if they wanted to come with repentance... John said, I'll baptize you with water unto repentance. And then he goes on to say, But he come, that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So what's the word repentance here mean? What is the word repentance in context here? What is its meaning? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance to a Pharisee. Do you, do you get it? Is it good works that Jesus or that John is telling is are necessary as part of salvation? No. Bring forth real repentance. Bring forth fruits of repentance. In other words, if that day, if I'm a Pharisee, I'm going to come and say, you know what? I'm setting aside all my works. All the good deeds that I've come, I realize that none of those good things I've done are going to save me. And I'm coming confessing that instead of being a good person, I am a sinner and I need salvation. That's the work of repentance. Literally, it's exactly what Jesus said when He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's believing in Jesus. That's repentance. In context. For salvation. And now we see in verse... 13 about Jesus, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat to the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now I want to stop here and I just want to simply say this. I can't, I can't begin to pretend to know anybody's heart, anybody's motive, or anything beyond what a person simply tells me. Uh, when, I, when I speak to people, normally I try to ask anybody, that believes that they're saved, I usually just ask them whether they've been born again. And if a person tells me something like, well, I've always gone to church, that isn't born, being born again. If a person tells me, you know, I was born into you know, a Christian family or a Christian nation, that isn't being born again. Okay, so I'm not confused about that. I know if a person has not looked to Jesus and made a willful choice to receive Him as their Savior, they are not born again. They're not believers. But now, if a person tells me, you know what, on thus and so day, I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Savior. I asked God to save me because of the work of the cross. And He did. And they're lying to me about it? I don't know. I don't know. 
Um, I have met people before that have said, you know, I was born into a Christian family. My mom and dad, we, it was they, their faith was an important thing to them. And so, you know, they kept bugging me about becoming a believer, about receiving Jesus as my Savior. And so finally, I just... I just said I wanted to be saved. I went forward to church and I prayed I prayed with a deacon or I prayed with a pastor or I prayed with my parents or I prayed with somebody. And the reason I did that, they will say, is because I wanted them to stop bothering me about it. Are they saved? See, the, 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 the words are not the work. Right? The prayer to be saved. The desire for Jesus saved me. This is what my dad's words were when he got saved. Jesus saved me. Those are the words my dad said. I'm telling you something. I believe my dad's born again. Not because he articulated a good prayer. God, I'm confessing all of my sins. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And God, I acknowledge repentance. I'm, uh, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. God doesn't forgive anybody of sins, my friend. God judges sin. And if you are forgiven, it is because God judged Jesus. And so to get forgiveness, you have to get Jesus. And when you get Jesus, my friend, then your sin is paid for. Your sin debt is paid for. You can confess your sins to God till you're blue in the face and God won't forgive it. He judges it. Or He wouldn't be a good God. Why should God forgive your sin and then judge His Son? Why should God forgive your sin and send someone else to hell? Simply just because you confess it? No, God judges sin. And when Jesus died on the cross, He died for my sin. He died for your sin. And so when I confess Jesus, I'm saying, God, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Am I going to keep my sin that Jesus has died for? No. But is repentance a matter of sin or is repentance a matter of Jesus? That's the question today. Is repentance a matter of sin or is repentance a matter of Jesus? My friend, repentance is a matter of Jesus. And you can come and be baptized and you can say blah, blah, blah. You can confess your sins like a Pharisee. God, I thank You that I'm not like this publican. That's as close to a confession as you get from a Pharisee. God, I'm really, really good. I hope You know it and everybody here knows it. I'm glad I'm not like this guy over here. It's not a confession. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the Gospel. My friend, I want us to understand it within its context here today. Lord Jesus is the one who tries and knows the hearts. And if you're here today and you're a Pharisee, you say, well, no, I'm not Jewish. You know what I mean by Pharisee. You're religious. You think that good works are going to do something for you. And you're even willing to go to church or you know do the whole God thing just, you know, just to ensure the things. I have to say to you, my friend, that the fruit meat for repentance is receiving Jesus as your Savior. And you must be born again. You must be born again. If you're a Sadducee and you're here and you say, well, I don't really believe in supernatural things, but just in case, I'll get baptized. Just in case, I'll go to church. Just in case, you know, I think religion's a good thing. It has its merits. I'll be religious. You must be born again. I will say finally that there is a Savior who is merciful, who is loving, who came in demonstration of God's love to die on the cross for your sins. His death was real. The blood that He shed was real blood. And He did it as an innocent individual who died for sin. And if you think that that same Savior who will also be the righteous judge of sinners will overlook your sin when He died for it so that you could receive forgiveness. If you think that He'll just simply say, well, that's another way, but it's good enough for me. You're, you're sadly mistaken, my friend. Jesus did not die for sin in vain. He died for sin because we actually committed it and we actually need to be born again. Ye must be born again. Father, I pray that You would increase the knowledge of this truth in our hearts Help us to see the necessity of repentance. And God, if there would be any person here today that even have doubts about their salvation, I pray that today would be the day that they would settle those matters and know for sure that they've received Jesus. No religion, no baptism, nothing that a person can do is the fruit meat for repentance. Only believing in Jesus.
God, you're the one that has the heart. Any person here today could say the right things and convince me. But you are the one who actually knows the heart. And God, any person who does not believe will be cut off. And I pray that there wouldn't be any unbelievers in this place. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. We're going to have a hymn of invitation today. It's going to be page 252. If you are here this morning and perhaps the invitation will be something that will be strange,